Sup, sup. Welcome back to the channel. I'm really excited for this week's video because we're going to talk about how the Power Rangers actually morph. But before we do that, we got to talk about the past, present, and future of comics. Old Comic Book Day, August the 5th, 2020. What a week. Uh, there were some great books this week, and I really enjoyed everything I read. The first one I want to talk about is Usagi Yojimbo, number 11. This was the first of a four-part story called The Return. We see Usagi returns back home to the village that he grew up in. We spend the first part of this issue getting backstory on his childhood. We meet his childhood rival, Kanichi. And they tell a great story where they were fishing and Kanichi kind of screws Usagi over. But he ends up catching a giant carp that's able to feed the entire village dinner that night. And so he comes out the hero even though Kanichi tried to prevent him from even being able to bring any fish in. In this story we also find out that Usagi has a son named Jotaro. Um, we also find out that Kanichi has raised his son and a lot of the village does not know that that is actually Usagi's son. So there's a level of drama there. You have the local politics of the village and then you even have, at the end, you have a samurai that we met in issue 8, I believe. He returns and he's been working for Lord Hikiji. However, he was originally loyal to Lord Mifune and so Usagi... He rubs Usagi the wrong way because he's changed loyalties. However, in this issue, when he shows up, he claims that he's only publicly been serving Lord Hikiji. And that he's ready to get revenge on Lord Mifune, and he needs Usagi's help doing so. I'm pretty excited to see where that goes. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Four issues, one down, so we got three great issues of action and revenge, it sounds like. So, really excited to see where that goes. The second book on my list is King of Nowhere number 4. I really enjoyed this one. It is a little bit different than the first three books. But honestly, it feels like the second to last movie of the Harry Potter movies. Or the second to last movie of the Hunger Game movies. Where it's really just a whole lot of setup for that final piece. And so with 5 being the, the final issue next month. This one felt like it was a lot of setup and it kind of changed the way the storytelling has been going. But we got a lot of answers to questions we've had probably the whole time. We find out how Dennis got to Nowhere. What was going on before he got to Nowhere. We find out that um, Nowhere is basically a nuclear test site. And that the government's been watching it with cameras everywhere. And they're basically trying to... Um, kind of like the Tuskegee experiments, the citizens of nowhere don't know that they were tested on with radioactivity or that they're being obser observed by the government, or even that the government has um, put chemicals into their water to see if they can cure the radiation or reverse the effects. So this is a really interesting series. We got into a lot of like politics and, and military stuff in this issue. But I think it provided a lot of context for what's about to happen in the next issue because at the end of this book, they're on their way to find Sheriff Tucker, who was born and raised in nowhere around the same time as the blast. And that's where his eye is at. We need to find out what the full story is on his eye, if he even knows why he's been working for the government and um, basically like helping them with their secret experiment and what all the connections are there. Maybe the government knows how to give him his eye back or something, but we don't know exactly what his motives are yet. His daughter Ellie, she's at the end of the book, she's ready to go get answers too. So I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how all of this plays out. If you remember last week, my predicted book of the week was Firepower number two, and it delivered on every level. I really enjoyed it. I know some people probably have issues with it because it's a, a large majority of this was a silent issue. But 
I really like that whenever it's well done like this. Essentially, at the beginning of the book, Owen wakes up just, or not even wakes up, but it picks up exactly where the first one ended. And so as he turns and looks up and him and the ninja start fighting, they end up in the hallway where there's another two or three ninjas. So Owen ends up in a fight with three to four ninjas in his house at night with his whole family there asleep. They're so quiet and so silent that they don't wake anybody up until inevitably some things go wrong toward the end of that fight and Owen's wife does wake up. She comes downstairs with a shotgun. She is ready to go and they chase the ninjas out and we get some dialogue exchanges there that explain what was going on. Um, it was not the Scorched Earth Clan this time. That was uh, Ma Gwang and his henchmen trying to test Owen to see if he still has all of his abilities because there's a lot of bad things about to happen. And then there's a very nice reveal right at the end of the book on the last page that sets up, I think, where this series is going for at least one story arc. And I'm really excited to see how that plays out because the artwork was absolutely beautiful and there's no way that this silent issue would have worked had it not been for the way that the shadows and the visuals were used to tell the whole story of like 14 pages of silent combat. Really enjoyed it. I thought it was great and I'm excited to see what firepower number three delivers on. The last book I want to talk about for this week is called Project Savior number five. And you probably haven't even heard of Project Savior one through four, but that's okay because I want to give you the rundown. This is a series that I've been reading for almost two years now, and it's not without its growing pains, but I really like where issue five hits. It seems to have found its stride. And honestly, I think anybody could jump on right here starting with issue five and get caught up pretty easily. Project Savior is basically about a vigilante in the style of Daredevil, um, maybe even your Batman, but he basically he gets cornered by a bully in defense of himself. He seems to develop almost um, like, uh, he, he almost is like a slightly enhanced, he's a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, um, better dexterity, better balance, you know. So more or less like Daredevil. Um, and he's in street level brawls. I really like the way that this book explores um, the city itself. Because they could just go completely all in on the psyche of the vigilante and what he's trying to do. But there's a lot of growth within the city itself. And you see a lot of his actions affect not only him and his growth as a vigilante, as a hero... It also affects the city around him. And when Scyther, the villain of this, has everybody on his payroll, it turns the vigilante into the villain, you know? And so he's constantly trying to protect and save people. At the same time, they're uninterested in being protected or saved by him because they see him as the bad guy. So issue five is kind of the, the second to last book in this series as far as his origin story. As I understand it, there's probably about another six issues planned to tell more of his story beyond this. But his origin story definitely feels like it's coming to a wrap with issue six. And I think anybody could jump on right here at five and pick it up and really get into it. Because Craig Johnson is a great creator who has grown so much. I mean, I read the first book and the art is, you know, not the greatest. The writing is... Um, very slowly paced in a lot of ways and so to come into this you know four issues later five issues later and see how much he's grown and changed and developed as a creator I'm really excited for what he can do as long as he continues to push himself and develop his talent that's project savior number five you can pick it up on his webs on Craig Johnson's website at projectsavior.com um, I think it's like three or four American dollars. He is a, I believe he's an English creator. I've never actually asked. Um, but Project Savior is spelled with an O-U-R at the end. So um, that definitely indicates to me that he's probably um, English, British. Um, but great series. I really suggest you go and pick it up. 
like I said, you can get it on his website. Uh, I read the digital versions, somewhere between three and four dollars, four American dollars. So uh, go check that out. It's definitely a series worth reading. Okay, this week on the Kickstarter Spotlight, there's going to be a couple books that I talked about last week. There's also going to be a couple of new books that I just discovered myself. The first one I want to talk about is Ninja Nuns Bad Habits Die Hard. This is a Metal Shark Bro spinoff. So if you're familiar with Metal Shark Bro, or if that title catches your attention, then you should definitely be looking into this. Metal Shark Bro is literally exactly what it sounds like. It is a Metal Shark Bro. And he sets the world on fire. The Ninja Nun spin off from that, and it's a 40 page one shot. It's done by Bob France, who I believe was involved in the Metal Shark Bro um, collections. And this is just good fun. Um, I talk about this all the time. There are books like Undiscovered Country where it can take me 30, 40 minutes to read just one issue of. And, and that's not to say it's not good, it's just wordy. But I think all the words are necessary in Undiscovered Country in order to really enjoy that. At the same time, I'm also reading a series called The Man Who Effed Up Time from John Lehman. And you can read an issue of that in like 5, maybe 10 minutes tops. Still, extremely enjoyable. I just talked about um, Firepower number 2. I mean, over half the issue is basically silent. But when I spent the time with the artwork that it needed to tell the story, that was still a 15-20 minute read, easy. So, all that to say, I think Ninja Nuns and Metal Shark Bro, they're great reads. They're fast paced. I look at the value of the entertainment. Did I get enough entertainment out of the time I spent with that book to justify the price of it? And I would say here, absolutely. Metal Shark Bro is great. I'm sure Ninja Nuns is going to be great. If you see it on Kickstarter, go ahead and back it. I definitely think it's worth the time and energy. The next book I want to talk about is Skies of Fire number 7. I talked about this quite a bit last week, uh, just before the Kickstarter launched. And so I'm really excited to say it's been going great. I think their initial request is $9,000 for funding. They're well over $12,000 at this point. So you know everybody is interested in this. Everybody's jumping on. Great books. I love the way they tell the story. And they really seem to understand the medium they're using to tell this story. So I love the way that they're utilizing comics to make a comic book. And, and not something that feels like it's just being crafted for the theater or TV. Because that's the, that's the great thing I love about Skies of Fire. It's definitely a comic book created to be a comic book. Not that it couldn't be adapted down the road, but it doesn't feel like the focus. And that's really important to me as a reader and a fan. Because this medium is unique, but there's so many people anymore that don't treat it that way. And Skies of Fire does a great job of being just a great comic book. Um, just being a great comic book. It, it understands the medium. Crossbones number three. I've talked about this one pretty extensively lately. But they do have the Kickstarter going. We got the 1500 that we needed for the print. So I'm super excited about that. Still continue to, to go back this because it is a good book. You will enjoy reading it. At $2,000 we unlock a couple more pages. They've been teased as pages of one of our favorite villains. So I have my suspicions as to who that is. But I'm going to let you figure it out on your own. Until then... Jump on Kickstarter and back this book so we can get to 2000 and get those extra pages. I think they will help make this book that much more enjoyable. So let's make it happen. Noir is the New Black. This is a book that I just recently came across. I was browsing through Kickstarter. I saw it and I immediately went to the page to see what we were getting into. It looks really interesting to me because I do like noir. I think um, the style is beautiful. I love the way that they talk. Um, I think the murder mystery aspect of it is always really interesting. So anybody that's going to bring noir into this, I'm excited to read. On top of that, it is a black creator initiative. So it's going to be an anthology with multiple different artists and writers telling stories 
uh, multiple different black creators telling multiple different stories that are set in a noir tone, but also just come from a, a place of trying to understand the world around us. I'm really excited for it. I know it can kind of come off as um, riding the wave, but whenever I read through the Kickstarter page, it definitely sincerely feels like they're creating something they want to create, not something that's just trying to catch catch on and ride the, the current trend or the current wave. The next book on my Kickstarter spotlight is PandaCon. And this is by Dave Garcia. It's an anthropomorphic style book, so something more or less like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, Usagi Yojimbo, or really almost just about any kid's cartoon from the 90s. Seems like they were all anthropomorphic, um, probably because the turtles took off like they did. Anyway, PandaCon... I don't really know a lot about this other than it's anthropomorphic pandas steeped in Eastern uh, martial art culture. It does appear that they're on a different planet, so maybe some Planet of the Apes sort of stuff going on there. And it also has like the sci-fi element because they do appear to travel through space at some point. So I'm really, I, I checked this book out. It looks really cool. I like the character designs. I like the art style. Um, it's essentially kind of an update and re-release, um, but this is a character that originally premiered in the, basically as a backup story for an Usagi Yojimbo book in the 80s. So that connection obviously caught my attention. I'm definitely going to check it out on that alone, but I would urge you to go check out the page and see if this is a story that would interest you if you are into the anthropomorphic um, adult Adult stories with a childlike tone is kind of how I describe them. I think the turtles in every way embody something that um, kids and children can latch on to. But at the same time, a lot of the themes and a lot of the issues that they address within those stories um, are very adult. And so that's kind of where I get that. I think they're adult stories with a childlike tone and they make for great reads to me. I love this animated series with the way things are going on going right now. Only animation can really work as far as like film and production. So we're probably going to see, I, I imagine in the future there is going to be a long uh, period of release where we see a bunch of animated stuff and not very much live action stuff because they're behind on production. And PandaCon is a perfect candidate for that. I wouldn't be surprised if all of these studios start snag trying to snag up all the animated properties they can because i could see where we get almost a year of just animated movies while they try to catch up live action production because again live action production shut down animation they're all working on computers from home they're still so you can still make animated movies whereas you cannot necessarily make live action movies so that's something to keep in mind as we think about everything else that's going on as well. Death Kanji, a Samurai Horror Graphic Novel. I talked about this one last week as well, but it's coming up right at the end. I do believe there's another day or two to go on that. Um, Jordan Patrick Finn, uh, search for Death Kanji on Kickstarter, and I'm sure it'll come up. Um, I believe they hit funding 100% the other day, so I'm excited to be able to get my book as soon as that ends. And it sounds like a really interesting story. I like the horror graphic novel aspect of it. And I can't wait to see... Uh, I can't wait to read this story and find out what it's all about. New comic book day for August the 12th. These are the books that will be coming out this week that I'm really excited for. Usagi Yojimbo number 12 and Usagi Yojimbo Color Classics number 6. Both of those are dropping this week. Um, I'm excited to see where 12 picks up with how 11 left off. And uh, number 6 is going to be interesting because this is going to be our introduction to the Blind Swords pick. So, you know, always good things going on in Usagi. Alienated number 5 comes out this week. I've been pretty up and down on this series, but at the end of the day, I really like what they're doing. These are some very dark, very heavy topics to explore, but they tackle them head on issue after issue. And that's enjoyable to me. So 
I'm excited to continue to see how that series progresses. I believe we are getting close to the end of it though. I think it's a limited run, probably five issues. So maybe this is the finale and I'm not even thinking about it. I'll need to check that out. It could also be six issues, so maybe there's still one more. I'm going to have to look that up. I'll probably update it with visuals. Something is Killing the Children, number nine. This series has been crazy from the get-go. If you've been reading it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't been reading it, you've probably heard me talk about it. So, get on this. I mean, there's one, I think there's one trade out so far that covers probably the first four to five issues. Um, number six, it felt like kind of picked up on a new storyline. So, I'm excited to see where it continues to go from there. Something is killing the children and they need to figure it out and stop it. Erica Slaughter is here with her, um, how Slaughter has showed up. They're trying to get, uh, get involved. So it's kind of becoming a crazy mess, but it's still organized and you can still keep up with what's going on. But there are a lot of characters. There are a lot of moving parts at this point. Get the trade, get caught up, jump on. This easily needs to become a Netflix series. I would like to see it go basically into Stranger Things territory, live action, child actors. However, with the climate the way it is right now, with everything that's going on, it's not hard to imagine them picking this up and running it as a animated series considering that's what's being made right now. So we'll see what happens. It's Boom Studios, I believe. So um, Netflix does have first look rights and... I don't know why they didn't pick it up already, but hopefully we'll hear something on that soon. Strange Skies over East Berlin. This was a four-part series that came out at the end of last year. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's written by Jeff Loveness, who wrote several uh, recent Rick and Morty episodes and even got an Emmy nomination for a very weird scene to get nominated. But... He's a great writer. I really enjoyed all four parts of this story. The first two were a little bit stronger than the last two, but I will be out there picking up the trade paperback whenever that drops because I really like this series. I would like to see Jeff Loveness do more. I really liked that it was four and done, and I hope that nobody decides to return to that world because I don't really see why. Let's keep moving forward. Let's keep finding new stories to tell. But I really like that one and I will be keeping it around so that I can continue to reread it as many times as my heart desires. Adventure Man number three. I think I missed the first book on this and ended up reading it like a week later. And I don't know, it blew me away. Like it is everything you expect and nothing you expect. It's set like in a weird, I don't know, like alternate past kind of... It, it reminds me of the world that's left behind in Fallout. Um, almost like a steampunkish kind of world, but then there's also the present that's being tied into it. Um, there's a lot of characters, there's a lot of moving parts, but we're only on issue three. It's easy to get caught up, and there's a lot to enjoy here. Um, so yeah, I would suggest everybody check that one out. If you're not already reading it, get caught up. It's totally worth it. This week we have an image number one coming out called Big Girls. I really don't know what exactly to expect out of this series. Um, it, what I can tell from the trailer is that it is basically these, these women that can grow to be giants. And they're, they work for the government. There's like a special government division that they work for. Um, so... I don't know, it, it doesn't look like it's going to lean too hard into kaiju, but yet there is also kind of this obvious like kaiju element to it. Um, I'm thinking like Charlie's Angels meets like Neon Genesis. Um, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to get out of it, but I am interested in checking it out. I will be picking up that number one. I haven't really heard anybody else talking about it, so I don't know... Um, you know what the market looks like for it. I hope other people are interested in it, but I'm gonna give it a try and see what's going on The Flash 759 
this feels like it's been a really long time. I don't know why, but it feels like it's been almost... Uh, okay, well, there was a point where... There was a point where this... Um, there was a point where the Flash felt like it was coming out every week. And now it feels like it's coming out, like, every other month. So, that's kind of a weird one, but... Um, I'm really enjoying Flash for what it is, for where it's headed, for what it's done. Um, at the end of the last one, we saw um, Zoom. Well, no, no, no. I'm sorry. At the end of the last one, we saw Reverse Flash basically enter Barry's body. And then we saw Barry is disconnected from um, the Speed Force. And he's just like falling through time and stuff and we see these warped versions of these other speedster characters so um that's really interesting where is barry at what's going on with this story uh why what what did reverse flash do to separate him from the speed force and what was going on there i don't know there's a lot of questions coming out of that um ultimately we are in the final arc of joshua williamson's run on the flash so i think it's like six issues total so there's probably like five more left of it or something i'm sure it's going to be a while before we get all the answers but i really like the way that joshua williamson writes to me he writes serialized comics better than almost anybody else because even whenever there's a cliffhanger it feels complete like if I read the ne I, it makes me want to read the next book, but it also doesn't make me feel like if something happened and I didn't get it, that I would be um, disappointed that it wasn't wrapped, if that makes any kind of sense. The epic conclusion of Necessary Evil brought a device back from another universe, the Void. It originally appeared in issues 31 through 39 of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers comic books in an arc known as Beyond the Grid. The device is called the Solaris, and it was used to absorb the rogue Morphin energy that had imbued the Empower with special abilities. So what is the Solaris? How was it able to absorb the Morphin energy, and where did it all go? Those questions led me on a journey to better understand what it means to say in time! We are initially introduced to the Solarix at the end and beginning of issues 31 and 32 respectively. From there, it mostly takes a backseat to the rest of the story until issues 36 through 39. In these issues, we get really deep into the history of the Solarix, but the important thing that we learn is that there is a mechanical part and a crystal part, and that crystal part is basically a super zero, zero crystal. crystal. There is a dense amount of other information in this part of the series about the zeo crystals, where the solar crystal came from, who it was stolen from, and what it is capable of. It's all really interesting, but definitely beyond the scope of this video. By issue 37, it is clear that the Solarix is basically a rechargeable battery. So the first step to understanding how the Solarix works is asking how a battery works. Batteries require three basic components. An anode, a cathode, and some kind of electrolyte. The anode is generally metal or alloy, which is a combination of two plus metals. A copper alloy would be perfect for this part and could very well be the outer casing of the Solarix. The cathode is usually a metallic oxide or a sulfide like lead or magnesium. Here we could use a small button of magnesium at the bottom of the chassis that is spring loaded to push down toward the back of the hand so that flexing a fist would push it up to make contact with the electrolyte. The electrolyte is an ionic conductor that separates the electrodes. Sulfuric acid is what we generally use in rechargeable batteries, but it's possible to use crystal. In fact, there are crystal batteries that are used that use crystallized salt as an electrolyte. So why not zeo or solar crystal? Because of the structure, crystals have the ability to filter frequencies. This is how we tune our radios, 
cell phones, internet routers, and GPS devices into certain frequencies, and we could do the same with morphine energy. For example, if mighty morphine energy was 10 megahertz and 20 megahertz is turbo, we would be able to tap into that energy and morph into those specific rangers. And that example could go even further by picking colors. Maybe 10.1 megahertz is the red mighty morphin power ranger and 10.2 megahertz is the pink mighty morphin ranger. 20.4 might be the yellow turbo. 30.6 could be the blue go buster. The possibilities are endless. When you connect the anode and cathode with a conductor, the electrons rush from one to the other to balance the poles. This is where the current comes from, and by placing resistance on the conductor, we create power that can be converted into mechanical energy. In the case of a morpher, the person is completing the circuit by touching the copper casing and the magnesium button against the solar crystal, and their body is the resistance that manifests the power of the suit. So that is it. Electrical theory and theoretical morphing all in one. Just think, when the buckle pops open on the mighty morpher, that could be triggering a contact under the coin to complete a circuit that releases the morphine energy. There are a million and one ways this could all work, but I've put together my best theory using the evidence I found in Beyond the Grid. There are a few leaps in logic here, and a few things I could piece together from story references, but I really enjoyed doing this and I hope everyone enjoyed watching. So let me know in the comments, what do you think of my theory? And how do you theorize morphing works? Until next week, keep flipping pages.